and welcome. I'm Michelle Martin Johnson with Love Life Coaching, and I'm so happy to have you here on my YouTube channel. And as you can see, I have with me here today a wonderful special guest, Meredith Miller. Welcome, Meredith. Thanks so much for inviting me. So happy to have you here. Uh, Meredith and I have had the privilege of being in touch for a number of years and work together. Meredith is one of my former clients. And Meredith is amazing, so you are in for a huge treat. And we're going to get right into it, but I do want to just give a real brief introduction of Meredith and um, also just mention that we will have some links to Meredith's work in the description box. We'll have a link to her amazing YouTube channel, her website, and also to her latest book on Amazon. And then Meredith will also tell you about a very important special offer that she has for those of you that might be interested in going deeper with this work. But Meredith Miller is a holistic coach and the author of The Journey, A Roadmap of Self-Healing After Narcissistic Abuse. Her mission is to bridge the gap between trauma and purpose. Meredith teaches mindset and tactical tools to help with recovery from narcissistic abuse and other toxic relationships. And you're gonna love what Meredith has to share. So Meredith, welcome once again. So excited to get into this with you. I'm happy to be here. Let's start, narcissism is a term that's used broadly out there in the world right now, but let's just start with narcissism 101, a very brief description of what it actually is, and then let's take it from there. So you're going to see traits of grandiosity, of entitlement, an excessive need for admiration or attention. You're probably going to see a lack of empathy. You are going to see a pattern, a very typical pattern of behavior, which is part of the abuse cycle where the person will idealize you initially. Also, we call love bombing. They'll give you this excessive amount of attention, approval, flattery, gifts something that you really want. And they'll hone in on exactly what it is that you want. And then it'll flip to devaluation and they'll start putting you down. And it's a cycle that will keep repeating. It could even be in the same day, the same conversation over a period of days, weeks, months, you'll see this cycle repeating. And so you'll feel like you're on a roller coaster of highs and lows. There's intensity in both directions and there's very little sense of peace and calm. And so they tend to get into these cycles with people. And those are usually the early flags that you're going to see. But there's going to be also two different variations. The overt type, which is very obvious, that person's probably going to tell you they're the biggest, they're the best, they're the most amazing thing that ever happened, or backhandedly do that. You know, so-and-so tells me <laughs> that I'm the best or whatever. And then there's the more covert aspect where the person will often, you know, appear to be a victim or a hero of some sort. So maybe they can even go back and forth depending on the situation. And so if they're more the victim type, when you first meet them, you're going to hear a lot of pity ploys. So what they're going to want is your sympathy. They're going to want you to feel bad. They're going to want you to see that as very vulnerable and you might almost lean into that feeling like you can help them. They might even tell you, you're just so amazing because you're listening to them or you're the only one who understands them. And that's a setup. And then the hero type might tell you about, you know, how they're like the best father in the world and their their kids are everything to them. And they're such a pillar in their community. And they went to Costco and they paid for their cart and the cart behind them. And they have to tell you, about it, you know, so these are the typical signs that you're going to see really early on, on those two different types of narcissism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't think uh, a lot of people understand that there are these different types of narcissism. And one of them perhaps is a little bit more hard to detect, a little bit more subtle. So it's an actual personality disorder, right? It's an actual, like, can be diagnosed personality disorder. Yeah, according to psychology and the paradigm that they work with in, in psychology, and I'm not a psychologist, I'm a holistic coach, so I don't fully subscribe to that. But they do, you know, have like a list of characteristics and they have a way of evaluating if a person has a full-blown personality disorder or not. And this is a place where I can see people get really caught up. It can become an obsession to try to figure out 
what exact diagnosis the person has, if they are, if they aren't, if they really have a full-blown personality or not. And that can really confuse people. It can cause people to even gaslight themselves. It can be a huge distraction from taking care of yourself, from healing yourself. So I would encourage people not to get too wrapped up in that. Just understand the the signs of the behavior that are unacceptable to you. You know, are these signs putting you down? Is this relationship roller coaster really disrupting your life, your sense of well-being, your health, your sanity? That's not healthy, whether that person has a diagnosed personality disorder or not. Yeah, I like what you said in one of our earlier conversations, Meredith, where you said it doesn't necessarily have to be for people out there in the world to figure out whether someone is a diagnosed narcissist. Look at the behaviors, look at how it feels when they show up in your life and how they treat you. And if the behaviors are are feeling uncomfortable or abusive or destructive in your lives, then that's something to pay attention to. And you don't necessarily have to have the quote unquote diagnosis of narcissism. You look at the behaviors and how they affect you. Yeah. And I want to add to, you know, at the beginning, a person may not exactly understand that. They just might feel like something's off. Something's really Mm -hmm. off about this. I would encourage you to listen to that feeling because you might be dealing with a covert type. And again, they're just the more sophisticated model. It's the same thing and it's going to lead to the same kind of destruction, but it's going to look a lot better initially. And so usually when people are dealing with the covert types, the first thing they start to get is that weird feeling that something's just off. It probably is. So always trust your intuition. I think as women, you know, we have a really strong sense of intuition. And, you know, people always tell me from the very beginning, they would see the signs, like their intuition did recognize it, but they were minimizing, they were normalizing the behavior. And so they didn't listen to their intuition, even though they knew or they had a sense that something was off. So I would really encourage women to listen to your intuition and act upon it. Yeah, I think that is so important and so profound. And I agree with you. I think that's one of our divinely given gifts as women is to have this intuition. And I always tell women, if something doesn't feel quite right to you, if something makes you feel uncomfortable, even if you can't specifically put your finger on it or identify what's going on or why you're feeling that way, notice that, pay attention to that. Don't step over that or ask more questions or recognize there's something more to be understood here. In fact, it's interesting, Meredith, because I was talking with a client last night and She's talking about this man that she met online, and she said one of the first things that he said to her was his life was complicated. And I thought, well, that was an interesting choice of a word to describe his life, isn't it? And um, so I was asking her, did you ask questions about that? And she said, no, I said, "Um, okay, your life must be complicated because you just moved and started a new job. And she said he was dead silent. He didn't respond at all to that. And so when I was talking to her, I said, you know, that's something to pay attention to. That's at least uh, something that there needs to be a little bit more understanding of what he means by complicated. That could mean he's married. That could mean a variety of things, right? It could be he's an alcoholic. It could be he's whatever, some close of gambler, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes they will tell you exactly who they are. It, they always do. And so you have to be listening though, right? Because we could hear that stuff and minimize it and say something like, well, yeah, because you just moved and this sort of thing. But we really ought to investigate more and listen when people tell us who they are. In fact, I think it's complicated as even an official relationship status on Facebook. Isn't it? It, is, it, is, it is. It is. It's complicated. And most of the time, we don't want to get into other people's complicated (laughs) web. (laughs) We can avoid it. Yeah. So, yeah, asking questions, not paying attention to that internal guide, paying attention to that intuition if something feels off. Another thing I've noticed, and I think we've talked about this before, too, with some of these relationships is they almost, in some cases, will start out as something that, like, is almost too good to be true. Right. And maybe that's as a result of the love bombing 
or the flattery or them knowing all the, the right things to say to kind of draw you in because a lot of these people are very skilled, very skilled in this. Would you say that's true? Sure. I think that also is connected to the PR campaign that everyone is oh. friendly on. You know, they're, they're the best, they're the greatest, they're the most amazing. And they really do have an uncanny ability of reading you from date one. And it's even more so if they can get you to share a lot of information, which I highly recommend women don't do on the early stage of dating. You know, they want to gather this information and this data mining process. They're assembling the mask that they're putting on to get you to think that they're everything you've been looking for. So they will provoke your fears and then pretend to provide the answer to that, to protect you and to make you feel secure. They will stoke your desires, all your unmet needs from childhood, all those unrealized fantasies from childhood. They will pretend to be exactly what they think you want. And you could get very confused in that phase. So what would be like an example of that? Give me, give us an example of how they might do that. So would it be something like, I'll let you give an example, but let me throw this out. Um, would it be like, maybe it's a woman who is a single mom and she talks about how she loved to have someone to help her with her kids or raise her kids or how much they need a male figure in their lives or whatever. And then the narcissist picks up on that and talks about how much he loves kids and what a great father he is or would be or so on and so forth and that kind of thing and like really taps into that so that he appears to be the ideal figure um, because she shared something vulnerable. Would that be an example of what you're talking about? That's exactly it. And maybe he's like Mr. Helpful and you know he look, he's even amazing with the kids. Like you might think, wow, I really hit the jackpot. You know, he's helping out with the kids and he's amazing, but this is just you know, that initial phase where he's making you believe that he's everything you ever wanted. Now, it could be something a lot more subtle. It could be like, maybe, you know, you were fully nurtured or loved or got the attention that you needed when you were a child. And so you tend to date men who are avoidant, you know, they're not there. They don't make you a priority. They don't really give to you. They breadcrumb you. And then you meet this guy and he's all in. I mean, it's so much attention. It's so much validation. It's you're amazing and all this. And, you know, he's always blowing up your phone all day long. And you're thinking, wow, I finally found the answer to my prayers. You know, here's this guy giving me everything I never had in childhood. But again, that's just the seduction phase. And we don't know what's coming next. Mm -hmm. What what do you think it is, Meredith, that causes the the switch to flip? Like, what causes them to go from, and you may not know this, and it may vary from case to case, but what causes them to go from being like Mr. Wonderful, so to speak, to all of a sudden flipping the switch into this behavior where they're treating you like dirt and they're maybe um, saying terrible things to you or they're gaslighting you or doing all these crazy things? crazy making behaviors. It, what is that? It, what is that that causes them to flip the switch? That could be a number of things. One could be you set a boundary. Maybe you're not available. Mm-hmm. You have to go out on the next day. You're not available. You've got your kids or you have another commitment. They're upset about that. So they flip it around. Maybe you say something that's not necessarily critical, but because they're hypersensitive to criticism, they start treating you poorly because they feel like they've been slighted. It's like a narcissistic injury. Or maybe, you know, you're a number on his roster, a woman, and somebody else is suddenly tickling his fancy more. And so now you're the scapegoat and this person's the most amazing and he starts triangulating you with somebody else already. Or maybe you don't even know that she exists, but he starts putting you down. You're like, I didn't do anything wrong. Nothing happened. We didn't have an argument or anything like that, but he just happened to meet somebody else and he happens to be investing more energy and attention over there right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a number of things can cause that to switch. And it can, like you said, it can happen in the same hour, in the same day, in the same week, in the same month, in the same cause. Oh, in the same conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So this is why it can be so crazy making because you're just like, you don't know who this person is or how they're going to show up from moment to moment. Yeah. And 
the way that they gaslight you too, because the the narcissistic person, the psychopathic person will always control your perception of reality. They'll distort reality into an unreality, but they'll get you to fully subscribe to that little by little over time. And you can really get into a place of cognitive dissonance and confusion and brain fog. And the longer this goes on, the more difficult it is to get out. So I highly recommend that women screen for this early on by asking more questions, not being so passive, not just leaning back so much, which is sometimes what we're taught to believe that a woman ought to do. We should be more proactive on those early dates. We should ask more questions to reveal this person and really listen, actively listen, not what you want to tell him and how you want to impress this guy, but really listening to what he's saying. And something I mentioned the last time we talked to, I think, was after that first date and after those first dates, if you like the guy and you want to see him again, open up a text file on your phone or your computer and write down everything you remember he said, because if he's going to gaslight you, you're going to be able to look back and recognize, no, he didn't say that. He said the exact opposite of that. And there's a lot of inconsistencies here or the story changed or, you know, you start to notice those things where maybe, you know, if you don't write those down, you just might get really excited. You might really go into the fantasy. You might not be paying attention and you might forget your brain might delete those things later on because you really like the guy and you want to pretend like those things didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I think that's such a great tip, Meredith. I really appreciate you sharing that again, because I think that would help us to avoid uh, that like questioning of our own sanity or our own memory when he's saying, well, I know that's not what I said, right? And you're like, I know that's what you said, but yet then we start doubting our own self and our own memory. And I think that's such great advice. And then also the advice you gave earlier, uh, I just want to emphasize too, is not sharing a lot of personal information. And this is another place where it gets confusing because a lot of dating advice out there tells us to be vulnerable and to share. And a certain amount of that makes sense at the right time. But sharing too much too soon can give the narcissist tools that he can potentially, he or she, whoever the mar narcissist may be, can use against you and can use as a tool to kind of like weasel their way in, in for nefarious reasons, right? Yeah. Or even later, use those things against you. You know, something I say is everything you say can and will be used against you because they might hold that card for a while uh, in, a, in a moment of true vulnerability of yours and just really hit you where it hurts. So be very cautious. I don't think entering with wide open vulnerability is a safe thing to do. We can't assume that we know that person on the other end, especially let's say you're online dating. You have no idea who this person is. You've met an avatar online, a digital avatar representation, curation of the image that this person wants to create. You have no idea who they are. So let's not fall in love with that. Let's not get carried away with that fantasy. Let's really investigate. Let's ask questions, not in an interrogative way, but like in a curiosity and warmth. Right. And sometimes we may need to practice this in the mirror because if we're coming from, you know, years of experiences of painful relationships and dating experiences, we can be very defensive. And that might come across as really harsh, you know, and it might come across as very cold. So we don't want to be cold and harsh. We don't want to be defensive, but we want to be able to recognize where we need to protect ourselves and also be warm and curious about this other person in front of us and see what they reveal about who they are, what their values are, what matters to them. What people talk about a lot is what really matters to them. So if you're on this date with the guy and he's like, my car and my house and all my expensive stuff, you know, that's what really matters to him. And he's impressing you about that. And if that really matters to you, well, then that might be a good match. But if that's not what you're looking for, you want someone with more depth, that's probably not going to be the guy for you. And sometimes you might know, oh, we can open him to the depth, but all he wants to talk about is superficial stuff because that's all that really matters to him. And that's where he's gaining his sense of self is all of this superficial stuff, this material stuff that he owns. Yeah, I think that's so important to keep in mind. And the idea of curiosity 
being curious, which can be, uh, like you said, you can do it in a way that is not like an interrogation. You know, it doesn't have to feel like you have the bright lights shining down on them that you're interrogating them. It can be as simple as asking a question like, when he says, for example, my life is complicated, say, oh, wow, interesting words you use there. Tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. Or, or what specifically do you mean by complicated? You know, be, not being afraid to ask the questions. And then I think that brings us to an important piece. You know, this is one of the four agreements. Don't make assumptions. I think that gets us into trouble so often because we kind of assume, we make assumptions about someone. For example, we might make assumptions about someone because they have all these trappings that they're very wealthy and successful. It could mean that they're just in a whole lot of debt. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's important to pay attention and to make not make assumptions, to be able to, to be courageous enough to ask those questions, especially when someone... Um, reveals something or says something that catches your attention. And I think a lot of times women in particular are afraid to do that because they're like afraid it will be too personal or too offensive or whatever. But it was like I told my client last night, I said, you have not only the right, but the responsibility to look after yourself. You can't assume that this other person that you're dealing with that you don't even really know yet has your best interests at heart can't assume that. We have to do our due diligence. Just like if you're going to rent a place or buy a place, you really want to look into it, right? You don't want to just sign a lease or purchase a place without really doing your due diligence. And that's something I think we might forget sometimes because we can get carried away in our feelings and how we feel about someone or how they made us feel. But that could just be a ruse. That could just be an illusion and not the truth. So it's always good to have more conversation, ask more questions, be more interested in the other person, rather than sometimes I think we feel like we have to show them that we're good enough, especially if we're coming from a place of low self-worth and we're trying to earn their approval versus asking, is this guy a good match for me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's so important. And that also brings me to another piece that you and I have talked about many times before, which is so important, which is a woman needs to be centered in knowing her own value, knowing that her value is not dependent upon what is or isn't happening with any other guy or any other person out there. And when we're really connected with that, it helps give us the confidence and clarity to navigate some of these situations with a lot more, um, a lot more focus a lot more confidence and um, we tend to not get ourselves so tangled up in these kinds of things um, because we're really clear about who we are, what's right for us and our own value and we're not dependent upon this other person up from the outside giving us that feedback or that reinforcement to stay centered there. Yeah. So I, sorry. Of course, there's really our greatest immunity to abuse and manipulation because if we have to choose between our self-worth and a relationship or another person, there's only one sane answer to that. And so when we rebuild our self-worth, if it's been destroyed in other relationships, which is often the case by the time we're in our 30s, 40s, 50s, right? We've all had some bad experiences. We need to rebuild ourselves then when we're standing on that foundation, it's very easy to make those choices. No matter how much you like the guy, you don't like him more than having self-worth. You know, and you have to reduce your self-worth. If you have to lower your value to stay in that relationship, that's not the right one for you. Right, right. So important. Another thing that I think is really key, Meredith, and I know we've talked about this one before too, is taking more time before you get super involved and super invested with a new person in your life. I think time reveals so many things because like we've already talked about, sometimes these um, relationships, which ultimately are going to be very unhealthy, start out in a way where it can feel really, really good. It can feel really, really right. It can feel really, really wonderful. Like you said, you can feel like, wow, it fits the jackpot. And yet, when we give this situation time to percolate and where we start to really see maybe there's 
inconsistencies between what he said before and what he's saying now or inconsistencies in words and behavior or inconsistencies in how he treats us or inconsistencies or um, patterns that start to show up that we wouldn't have initially seen, then we can avoid so much heartache and so much sadness and so much pain. So I always say to women, time is, is your friend. Taking your time, especially on the front end, before you really get emotionally, physically, sexually involved with someone is going to help pay such great dividends over the long run. I just think that's something that's almost universally beneficial for women out there dating. For sure. Slowing down. You know, we live in a culture where everything is so rushed and we feel like we have to keep up with that pace, but slowing down. Also, maybe sometimes, you know, we think about biological clocks or I'm just getting older and I want to have my partner and we're in this sense of urgency, right? To connect with somebody and urgency is always a trauma symptom. So anytime you feel really urgent need to connect, to get married, to get engaged, to have a baby, whatever it is, slow it down, take a breath, really evaluate, take the time to get to know this person because they're going to reveal themselves. You know, the only question is, are you listening when they do that? And they will reveal themselves in the first few months. Like there's no way that a person isn't revealing those aspects of themselves, even though they have a good mask, even though they're very skilled at creating that PR campaign and that image, there's always going to be those little inconsistencies, right? And then we just have to be able to notice those because the, the trouble is that if you've had a history of trauma, especially if we've grown up in a family system like that, our nervous system will automatically minimize those things. It will dismiss, it will normalize, minimize those things, and we won't want to see those things. And then we get deeper and we get deeper into that, and then we're in big trouble down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, time is definitely your friend when it comes to these things, because if people do reveal themselves. And then, like you said, it's a matter of us listening, paying attention, not gaslighting ourselves, not dismiss dismissing or diminishing what's coming up not putting on the blinders. It's been interesting because over the years as I've spoken with women that I've worked with and they've shared with me some of their um, relationships from the past that haven't worked out or have been abusive or very painful, uh, I've asked them, I said, you know, I understand now hindsight's twenty twenty, but looking back on it, were there signs? Were there indicators? Did you ever have that feeling inside that something was off or did you ever have signals or signs that, th that it might ultimately end this way? And in almost every case, almost 100% of women have said yes. So in addition to taking the time, we also have to be willing to tell ourselves the truth. And we have to be willing to pay attention to those things and not step over them or minimize them when they happen. I think that's so key. This is why it's so important to do our inner work. Because when we have unresolved trauma, that stuff is going to sabotage us. No matter how much we know consciously, we can know all the symptoms and signs of narcissism. and We could have had experiences of it. But if we haven't resolved those painful situations from the past, our biology is going to betray us in the moment. Our nervous system is going to lean into that as something familiar, even though it's abusive and manipulative and it's the same trauma we've already lived because it is familiar. So that's something that we ought to be cautious of and recognize that the importance of doing our inner work and getting healthier and getting healthier, because we've all been through some kinds of traumas in our life, especially relational traumas. And so the more that you heal and release the trauma of the past, the easier you're going to be able to see things. You're not going to have that biological sabotage that's taking place. Mm -hmm. This is one of the reasons why... Uh we as human beings oftentimes tend to repeat relationship patterns that are not healthy because they they are familiar like this person that we're this person that we're attracted to if we haven't done that inner work and that healing work we're likely to attract the same person different face kind of thing same traits same personality traits and attributes with a different face because that's going to be who we're drawn to out of this, out of this pain, exactly. out of this unresolved and unhealed pain, right? Yeah. And then the magic though, is that as a result, that trauma, we develop an almost 
allergy to those signs. We see that, we recognize it immediately. It doesn't feel good. We, we feel disgust instead of attraction or leaning into that or the comfort of that. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this reminds me of one other thing that I want to mention along the, these lines is that uh, another thing that can be a false flag, so to speak, is an overemphasis on chemistry. Because if we, again, if we have these unhealed wounds and haven't done the inner work, we can be really attracted to the wrong people. Like the sexual chemistry can be really strong to the wrong people. And, and so many people believe that, um, that a- attraction e- equals compatibility or chemistry equals compatibility, which is not necessarily the case. Chemistry can mean all kinds of things and it can be like fool's gold. It can seem like it's the real thing. And yet, once you get into it, it's not at all what you anticipated. And so that's another reason to slow down uh, getting physically involved with someone because the sexual chemistry can also get us tangled up with these people. And then we're going to wake up one day in the smoke, dust and ashes and going, how in the world did I get here? Right. And I think there's like this cultural temptation to jump in too quick, right? And there's like this expectation and even with like feminism and all of this, like, oh, you should be able to do, okay, but what results do you want though? You know, do you, do you want a committed relationship? Do you want a man who's capable and wanting to have a committed relationship? Don't jump into bed with him. Take time to get to know him outside. Don't invite him to your house. Don't go to his house right away because there's just too much temptation. You might think, well, it's fine. We can just have dinner at his place. That may not be the best idea. Right. So getting to know people with the boundaries of being outside, you know, getting to know them in a public sort of environment for a while is going to help. And then, of course, talking about it, you know, because of course a man is going to try. That's what they do. And that's okay. It's not like he's a bad guy because he tries to get with you physically, but that's a good time for you to express your values, your boundaries, your desire to get to know him over time. And, you know, not allowing the cultural pressure, we have to set those standards for ourselves. Even if all of the culture is going along with that, because that's what's condoned, we have to be the ones who say, I'm going to raise the bar for myself. I'm going to raise the standard for myself. I want to get to know somebody first platonically to see if we are compatible. I want to ask these questions. I want to reveal who he is and what matters to him to see, do we have shared values? Is there a possible shared mission and purpose for us? Because I think if we think about, you know, the healthy couples that we know, the ones that have been together for a while and not just been together for a while, but are happy and fulfilled, most of us know very few couples like that. And the ones that are have some kind of shared purpose. They definitely have shared values, but they have a shared purpose. And that's like the glue that keeps them together. And I think another danger women can fall into is if we have this unresolved trauma from the past, we might be looking for a man who can hear that, who wants to talk about that, who sympathizes with that, or worse yet, has been through the same thing. And now we're bonding based on shared trauma versus shared values and purpose. So when we bond based on shared trauma, what we're going to get is more trauma. Even if that's a good person, that may not be a narcissist. That may be a person who's who's broken in some way. You know, when we have this unresolved trauma, there's something broken inside of us. That's not like a shaming thing. That's just reality, right? So we want to heal those things so that we're not looking for that person to validate our pain. We're looking for somebody who wants to exponentially grow with us through this partnership. Right, right. Yeah. It's not ideal to bond over your baggage in those first few days because like you said, that again, that can be a sign of two people that haven't done enough healing work coming together. And the combination of that is not going to end up being, (laughs) is not likely to end up being a great relationship. So I think that's really, really important. I love what you just said there. I think that there were some real gems in what you just said. And um, I think it can really help a lot of women. Uh, Before we go on and talk a little bit about your book and a, a little bit more about your work, Meredith, would you be willing to share any other ideas or tips that we may not have talked about yet for women that are out there dating? Is there anything else that comes to mind that you want to share 
Um, just as far as like early signs to be aware of or things to just kind of be aware of that they that can help them to potentially not get themselves tangled up in these kinds of relationships? Yeah, um, I would pay attention to his availability. Mm-hmm. So a man who is really available, like intensely available initially, bombarding your phone and all that may suddenly disappear, may suddenly become less available you know, in responding or reaching out, those inconsistencies of availability are usually a bad sign. It's usually either a sign that there's someone else or multiple someone else's, or it's a sign that he has an avoidant wound from childhood. And so, you know, he gets close, but as soon as he senses intimacy, he's going to pull away. That's going to be a very painful thing that you can't fix. It's a very painful dynamic that could almost be more painful than being with a narcissist because you see this good person and you want to connect with them and you want to be close with them and they just won't yet let you and it feels like an impossible situation, it's very painful. Um, so, you know, may, or maybe there's just something else in their life and they can't make you a priority or they don't want to make you a priority. They're always with their friends or their kids or their work, you know, and we might think, oh, work, it's a noble thing, right? Of course we want a man who's working and he's hardworking and, you know, he's not going to be living off of us and our hard work, that might look like a desirable treat, but it might be that he's hiding behind work, that work is a way that he's unavailable for intimacy and commitment and true connection. So paying attention to his availability, his unavailability, the inconsistencies, you know, if he's always disappearing a few nights a week, he's probably seeing someone else. You should probably assume that. And, you know, not not assume that he's being loyal to you, not even assume that he's looking for a monogamous connection, even though he may have bombarded you with all of this contact initially. Yeah, I think that's such a good one. It's such an important one. And another thing I think, uh, and we've touched on this just a little bit, but I just want to put another little accent on it is controlling behavior. I think controlling behavior of any kind is something to really, really pay attention to. Like even this can even start, I've noticed in very early interactions, like some of these guys online where you exchange a message or two and then you don't get back to them right away. And they're like, like lashing out online. They're saying, you know, they're sending you a rude message basically saying, oh, what do you think you're too good for me or whatever? And I'm like, This person is a complete and total stranger. This is not someone that has priority status in your life, but it's almost like they're starting out right from the beginning, like they own you, like they can control you, or like you were talking about earlier, like maybe you have plans or you want to do something else with friends or family or whatever, and then they're really upset and mad with you and they go from being Prince Charming charming to being a nightmare, you know, the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde effect. Because they're, you're not going to be under their control for that number of hours or whatever. And I think um, any kind of controlling behavior, I think, is something to pay huge attention to. And we can misread it, right? So like the whole monopolization of your time is a form of control, but that can be misread as the attention or the validation that you always wanted, especially if the last guy was so unavailable and this guy is suddenly bombarding you all day long, you don't realize that's a form of control. He wants to always be on your mind. He wants to know where you are. He wants to make sure that, you know, you're always free, that you're not seeing anybody else, but then he disappears, right? So it's like, it doesn't work in both directions. So the controlling could come across in really subtle ways as well. And it's good to be very conscious of that. You know, even subtle things, like maybe you're on a date and you went out for food, and you don't like a certain thing. And he's like, here, you got to try this. And you're like, no, thank you. And he's like, no, you have to try it. And you're like, no, thank you. No, come on, you have to try it. Or, you know, that's a controlling behavior. It may even seem like he's being sweet or cute or joking, but that's a controlling behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So those are those are a couple of additional things to pay close attention to. And I think the availability piece that you mentioned is so key as well. Because that can get really confusing. A lot of times they'll come on like gangbusters and they will be very available and possibly even controlling. And then like if they've got other things going or like you said, someone else is flattering them more, giving them more of what they want, then they start being unavailable. 
and uh, consistency in how someone shows up, I think, is a is a is a good thing to watch for. Consistency, someone that you can count on. I've said to my husband many times over our now seventeen year marriage. I've said to him, I said, "There's few things that are sexier than someone that shows up for me every day." Over the long run, that is a really big deal. It is, and it's actually really rare. It's hard to find consistency nowadays. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So something, another something to pay attention to. So I've loved this conversation. I think it's so valuable. And uh, for the people out there listening, I also want to give Meredith the chance to tell us a little bit about her newest book which is called The Quick Start Guide, Narcissistic Abuse Recovery. And I love this because it's a it's a quick read, but it gives some very tangible and specific steps that you can take if you have experienced some of these unhealthy kind of relationships. I'll let you say more. And then I want you to also share a little bit about um, your work and um, the special that you have for our listeners as well. So the quick start guide is the three most essential steps for a person who's just realizing that they are in or were in a relationship with some kind of narcissist or psychopath or controlling, abusive, manipulative person. So these first three steps are just very condensed. My point was not to give a person too much information because when you're in that early stage, you're confused, you're overwhelmed, you're in a brain fog, it's hard to retain information. And also because there's so much information out there, we can get paralyzed and not know what to do. So this book has the action steps, those first three action steps, why you need to take these steps, what happens if you don't take these steps. And it leads you through this path so that you can start moving forward out of the pain from one of those relationships and help you to stop repeating as well. Because you know they say the average is seven times that a person goes back to an abuser. But that could also be seven different abusive people, you know, one to the next to the next. And when we don't resolve those issues after the abuse, we tend to get into another one and another one and another one. And they progressively get more covert. That's the interesting thing that I've noticed. So it's like you have to keep developing your awareness and your skills to keep up with it. And eventually you start moving forward in the healing process and you develop an allergy to that behavior and you don't want to be around it again. But most of us get stuck in that repetition cycle. So the book is to help you get out of that, to start actually moving forward after one of these relationships. And it also explains, you know, what are the biological factors working against you? For example, one of the steps is no contact, you know, completely cutting off this person out of your life. That feels like death to your nervous system because your nervous system reads disconnection as a life threat. We're mammals. We need connection for for health, for sanity, for homeostasis. It's part of our, our innate needs. So when we're trying to cut off this person from our life, our whole biology is like, no, don't do that. No, don't do that. But it's working against us because we're in unhealthy connections. That's much more dangerous for our health than not being in a connection with somebody right now. So that's one of those things that we have to work through to help ourselves overcome that and remind ourselves, you know, of course, I'm feeling this pull to go back to this person. I'm feeling this draw, this craving to reconnect with them. And that's usually sort of like a distorted desire, either for closure, because we think we can finally have that one more conversation and then everything is going to be okay. And it's not, or you're trying to repair the relationship, but it's an impossible connection. So there are we our own biology can work against us. And I've highlighted those um, those things for people and given them some ideas how they can overcome that uh, that biological impulse. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah, I would highly recommend checking it out and it's available. We'll put the link in the description, like I said, and it's available on Amazon as an ebook or as hard copy book. I love still having hard copy books and like I've taken all kinds of notes from from what Meredith has shared here in the book and in our conversations. And I think you'll really um, find it valuable um, because even if you haven't experienced one of these kinds of relationships, just having awareness around it can be extremely helpful so that you can avoid uh, getting 
um, in one of those kind of relationships in the future. And Meredith, I also know that you have an, an incredible YouTube channel. You have to check out Meredith's YouTube channel. It's called Inner Integration, right? We'll put a link to that in the description as well. And then do you want to share a little bit about um, your coaching and the special you have for our audience? Sure. Yeah, I do one-on-one coaching for people who are recovering after narcissistic abuse and other toxic relationships. I do them in one-on-one, or one session at a time, or they can purchase a package of five sessions. And I have a discount until the end of this year, the end of 2023. So if they use in all capitals, coaching 2023, they're going to get a 20% discount on the 50-minute sessions or the package of five sessions. And then I also offer digital courses they can check out on my website if they want to do those courses on their own, on their own time, working through those. They're very affordable and they're to help people who have been through these relationships, also those who have come out of these family systems, because that's often the case, though not always, when we get into repetitive relationships with narcissists and psychopaths. Sometimes it's because of our early childhood programming. So those courses will help people recover after this kind of abuse. That's wonderful. So I encourage you, if this resonates with you and if any of this feels like it could be a benefit to you, to be sure to check out Meredith's resources. She has spent years and years and years of her life creating massive amounts of valuable resources on this topic. And uh, we believe that um, her work can be beneficial to many people. So be sure to check it out if it resonates with you. And Meredith, as always, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to connect again. It was so much fun. Thank you. Loved having you on my channel and look forward to talking with you again sometime soon. Bye-bye for now. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks for watching. <laughs>